Have you ever been entrusted with a huge sum of money by your boss and told to manage it wisely until he returns? Picture it this way. Your boss, the CEO of your company, has just called three of his top managers into his office. You're the most junior of the bunch. He gives the other two staggering sums of money. Then he hands you your account, and your eyes just about bug out. There's a quarter of a million dollars there. He tells you all to get to work, and he leaves. Today's gospel lesson is another parable given by Jesus on the Monday of Holy Week. Remember what's been happening. Jesus had ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey the previous day. After that, he had cleared the temple from all the money changers and the sellers of animals the next day, this day, he returned and he's challenged by the religious authorities until they can no longer face his responses. And all of this was happening very publicly in the temple. Now, he has left the temple and he has traveled with his disciples up onto the Mount of Olives. And he's been teaching them because they have asked him about the end times. He uses parables, earthly stories with heavenly meanings, to tell them what the kingdom will be like. Today's Gospel lesson is another of the series of parables that he gave that day. Now I will tell you, there are many interpretations about this parable, and many of them are diametrically opposed to one another, especially with who the hero is. Yet for me, the more compelling question is one of behavior when presented with an assignment with an unknown end time. First though, we need a, a historical note for context. The man, the master, was likely a king. That's certainly the way Jesus' hearers would have heard it. Because of the amounts of money mentioned. And by the way, at the ending, where he tells them that he's given them just a few things. We'll talk about that later. A talent was commonly worth about 15 years of the average day laborer's wage. Remember, that was a denarii. Put in today's terms and in today's values, one talent would be equivalent to $226,200. A quarter of a million, shall we say. And that was being given to a minimum wage worker. Now, these employees were slaves. 
But what we don't necessarily remember is that even slaves, and especially slaves, I might add, were given a daily allowance, often a denarii, sometimes even more, depending on their value to their owner. And before you scoff that slaves would never be entrusted with so much money, there are plenty of historical references of just that. In fact, one reference specifically mentioned that the imperial treasurer was the only slave who could never hope to earn his freedom. Enslaved, he could be severely punished or even killed for misusing the treasure entrusted to him. So, how do we behave when an assignment is given with no foreseeable or obvious end point? Don't know any of those? We'll talk about that in a moment, too. Think about it this way, though, for the moment. How do we behave when we're given an assignment in school or at work, or maybe even just being involved with a hobby or something for the community? There's an event coming up, and it's something you really, really want to participate in. Maybe you need to enter. Maybe you need to register. You need to practice. You need to study. You need to write. You need to train. You need to prepare. Of course, you have a choice. You could put things off and do other things which seem to be much more important at the time. But what happens when that event comes around? Perhaps, though, we should consider our other readings first. In Judges, we hear the people have sinned. It's not the first time in Judges, it won't be the last. It hasn't been all that long, though since the people had entered the Promised Land and promised to be faithful to God. But they turned away. And so, they were punished. And at this point, this strong oppressor has ruled over them for 20 long years. It's happening in the northern region of Israel. And this is long before the monarchy this is long before the kingdoms divided. There were still tribes living in the land. In this case, it was in the northern portion. Deborah, a woman, a prophetess, a leader, was serving as judge. It's clear that she was well respected. And that respect extended far beyond her own territories. Because Barak, who was under the oppression in the northern part of Israel, came when he was summoned. She makes it clear that it is not 
her words that she is speaking, but Yahweh's. And Yahweh is about to act. Yahweh is responding to the cries of the oppressed people. Outside of our reading, Barak sees this message as risky and tells Deborah that he will do it only if she accompanies him. She tells him she will, but the victory of a Sisera will not be by his activity, but by a woman. In 1 Thessalonians, we hear the call for faithfulness, naming the Thessalonian Christians as children of light. They're called to encourage each other since they belong to Christ. And that cannot be taken away from them. Paul tells them, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord. Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Paul is speaking of their faithfulness, speaking of their love, and how it is, in, how it is permeating their very being and their community. And because of it, they show how they are indeed children of light. But then, what do we make of the parable? Is it, is it about being productive, risking much, but gaining much? two slaves receive the same reward even though the amount they earn is far different. Is the parable against sloth or laziness? The master calls the third slave lazy. Is it about fear the third slave says he was afraid. Arguments could be made for all of these things. But we might miss that this, like the other parables given that day, are clearly eschatological and about the kingdom of God. If so, then the focus shifts subtly to living, knowing the future, the return of Christ. The master has given each of the slaves talents or maybe we should call them abilities, as they were able to use them. He has evaluated each of them and gives them what they are able to be productive with, without overwhelming them. He allows them the freedom to act, 
trusted that they will do as they have been trained in whatever way seems best in the circumstances they find themselves. In some ways, we are doing that in this time of COVID as we have changed the ways we worship, including such things as virtual worship services to protect others. In the parable, the expectation is that the slaves will step out and risk everything to bring the word of God to their world. The third slave, he chose not to. He didn't want to risk and instead took the safe and what others might have said was a prudent step of burying the talent, which, by the way, was a common practice to safeguard valuables in the ancient times. As disciples, we are called to risk everything for our Lord and Savior. Not because we can gain our way into the kingdom, but because we have been entrusted with a treasure beyond price that we are called to share with our world. It isn't always said it isn't always easy. In fact, it's often challenging. But we have to know that we are never given a task beyond our abilities. Remember, remember how the Master gave each of the slaves the talents with regard to their abilities. It is the same way with our Heavenly Father. He calls us into ministries, often stretching us in ways we could not have previously expected, but also always equipping us for that ministry. He does not want us to fail in our service to him. When Jesus returns, we will have the opportunity to show how we used what he has given us to serve others in his kingdom then we too will hear the words, well done, come in to my joy, come in to the feast. Amen and amen.